This is the That You May Know Him podcast, illuminating biblical truth and applying it to faith, life, and culture. I'm your host, Jesse Dunn, joined by my co-host, Blake Barbera. Blake, how you doing today, man? Hey, Jesse. Doing well, brother. Um, glad to have you back. We missed you last week. You got sick, and I flew solo. Uh, that was my first solo pod of the year. You know it was what, fun, but it's better having you here. You know what, man? I think you did a pretty good job. I uh, I feel like you've done this once or twice before. Wow. wow. Thanks, Jesse. That means a lot coming from you, man. <laughs> it really does. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> good to have you back, man. How are your travels? Good, good. I just uh, kind of wrapped up my travels yesterday, and uh, I calculated. I think I've been, uh, think I've been out of town for twelve days so far this month. <laughs> so, Oof. yeah, it's I don't envy you there. It's been a busy one, but uh, glad I'm not sick anymore. And uh, yeah, I was ready to do yesterday or last week's podcast, and then I, I got on ready to do this with Blake, and Blake is like, you look terrible <laughs> you should not do this so. we've known each other long enough we can be honest yeah 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 Any, anyhow i'm, I'm hey. feeling a lot better um we're good. good this um hey jesse sorry sorry to cut you off should we preview next week real quick at the beginning of the episode yeah why don't, so you, don't why don't you go ahead and do that yeah okay so first of all i just want to say this before we start we have easter coming up this sunday resurrection sunday whatever you want to call it good friday if you're listening to this friday morning when it first comes out in audio form i hope that you have time today to reflect on what the lord has done for you what the lord has done for us in giving his life that's what our lives are all about but we especially focus on that as a church around the world this week and this weekend christ giving himself atoning for our sins and then being raised from the dead uh, which we celebrate this Sunday. So happy Easter to all of our listeners. May you make the day all about Jesus. Also, next week on the podcast, I'm excited to say, super excited to say, we have a wonderful guest coming on the show. I never thought in a million years that we would have Dr. Craig Keener, who is an outstanding New Testament scholar, uh, the author of many, many books and commentaries, and a wonderful follower of Jesus, coming on the show to talk about the spiritual gifts and the continuation of miracles in the church. So I hope that you're able to join us, Lord willing, uh, next week. It won't be a live episode. It will be pre-recorded, but uh, we're excited, super excited and thankful to have Dr. Keener on the show. So finish this week's episode and then come back next week for uh, for a really special one. Yeah, awesome. That's going to be, it's going to be really exciting. He, uh, he literally wrote the book on miracles. So. <laughs> literally wrote the book. <laughs> so that'll, exactly. that'll be pretty exciting to kind of, uh, I don't know about wrap up what we've been talking about the last few weeks. Not that we won't dive back into it, but we might might be pivoting a little bit, but it'll be a nice kind of cherry on top of the Sunday for sure. Um, Absolutely. As Blake mentioned in last week's episode, this week we are going to talk about women. And what the Bible says about this section of scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, the women should keep silent in the church. And mm -hmm. what exactly did the apostle Paul mean when he said the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, especially yep. in, in light of the fact that elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, he seems to approve of women participating in the church, right? Yep. Uh, yep. Women uh, prophesy and serve in many different capacities. Um, so the passage that we're looking today is 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35. Yep. Should we dive into it, Blake? Absolutely, brother. Uh, absolutely. And it's, I think it's the right time that we deal with this passage, not deal with it, that we study and deep dive into this passage because we've been in first Corinthians 14. It seems like for maybe the last month in talking about spiritual gifts, tongues and prophecy, this is the next thing that we come to. And honestly, brother, uh, this episode, I want to just fully commit to laying out all the views and all the possibilities. We want to try to fully embody our 
one of our new mottos on the that you may know him podcast, which is educate, not indoctrinate. So I'm going to tell you what the diff we're going to tell you and talk about what the views are like traditionally in the church that are held regarding this passage. But I, I will say off the jump, the reason I think it's important is because this, this verse does get used, I think in unfair ways that never would have been approved by the apostle Paul. Um, you know, it, it does come sort of out of nowhere in first Corinthians. I mean, you're reading about prophecy in the church. You're reading about letting prophets discern what one another are saying and let, you know, letting pro having prophets be gracious and listen to one another. And then all of a sudden you have verse 34 and 35, the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Anyway, I just, we, we want to give it a fair, uh, we want to give it a fair study and a fair deep dive and see if there's more going on than what we first see on the surface. Is that a fair segue, Jesse, to what we're trying to do today? Yes. Yes. That's okay. Fair. So there's three main options. Let's let's just get into it then. And the first option, and Jesse, I want to just, I'll lay out each option one at a time and we can just dialogue about them as we go. Option number one for how this verse is traditionally interpreted is the one that maybe you've heard the most about. Option one is Paul in this passage is calling for the universal silence of all women in every church throughout history. So a lot of people believe this too, uh, especially a lot of evangelicals in the West. Paul is giving, they would say, a blanket universal command that every woman everywhere in all churches should be quiet. Once church begins, women are not permitted to speak. The Greek word in this passage translated for, you know, typically translated in English Bibles, silent, is the word sigao. And it means in its most basic form, to say nothing, say nothing at all. I've heard some people say, you know, the word could mean like talking about a specific subject. I mean, to be honest, the word silent, when it's most often used, how it's most often used in the New Testament is don't make noise. Don't say anything. Paul could very well be calling for the quietness of all women when the church is gathered together. At least, as I said, this is what many people say. But the problem with this view is that elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, particularly I'm thinking of chapter 11, verse 5, Paul addresses women praying and prophesying in the church. And he doesn't say anything about them being quiet. It would be pretty tough to prophesy in church quietly since we've already been told that prophecy is for the congregation but he doesn't say anything in chapter 11 about them being quiet. He says, if women pray or prophesy in the church, they should do it with their heads covered, which is a completely different conversation that I'm happy to have one day. And I hope we do have on the podcast. So Jesse, does it seem like maybe off the cuff there could be, if you read first Corinthians 14, 34, as women are not allowed to speak in church, there could be a contradiction here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think we should talk about these main three views and then maybe we circle back around to, you know, why some of them could be valid or invalid. But, you know, off the cuff, this is the type of view that you have a lot of your you have a lot of your conservative, well-known evangelical pastors teaching your your Paul Washers, your John MacArthur's. Right. Uh -huh. That, you know, when they hear a woman a woman teaching or speaking in any form, their essential response is to go home and be quiet. Right. right? right. We've heard as much from, uh, we, we've heard these words from some of them. And uh, right. I don't know that that's necessarily the view that Paul is trying to convey here in this passage. Right. Or right. that's being, being conveyed, but let's, yeah. but let's, yeah, especially in light of 1 Corinthians 11, 5. But let's dive into some of the the other views as well. Okay, okay. 
Yeah. Uh, I just just to 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 piggyback on what you said, and and then we'll I'll lay out the other two views. Uh, a lot of people do conflate this passage with what Paul says in other places, like in the letters to Timothy, where he talks about eldership in the church and that being a position that men hold. And they, they conflate the two in such a way as to act like if a woman speaks in church, then she somehow is trying to be a pastor of a church. And I don't, I don't really see the two being connected at all. This passage, the context of it is the full participation of the church in the service. And more specifically than that, spiritual gifts being used in the church. But anyway, I just wanted to say that because when you talk about this view, the conservative evangelical view that women shouldn't speak in church, it does often get conflated with the idea of, with the question, should women be pastors? And I don't think, I don't think it's the same question at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, th those, whether or not a woman can speak in church and we're talking about things like prophesying and praying in the church, that's not the same as assuming a position of eldership or authority in that, in that church. Um, and we can definitely yeah. dive into that in a further episode. And I think we should on what that's supposed to look like. So I think um, we should too. You know, this could be an interesting little mini series that ends up happening down the road. I um, hope it does. But what's so what's option two? Blake, option two. I, I, I want to I, I do want to come back and circle back around to, you know, some of the other things, you know, about, you know, maybe why option one, you know, maybe some of the other problems with that. But what are some of the other options? Let's just lay those out. OK, so option two is one that maybe some listeners will be surprised to hear, um, but I think it's valid. And uh, option two for first Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 is that Paul never actually wrote these words that they are not original to the Corinthian letter. Now hear me out and let me explain what's behind this option. There are two places in the new Testament where textual critics or New Testament scholars more often than not think that a textual interpolation, I'm going to define these words, has made its way into the New Testament. So first of all, textual criticism is the study of the New Testament, at least New Testament textual criticism, manuscripts, right? There are now well over 2,000 variant copies of the New Testament in old Greek manuscript form and other languages as well. And the way we get our Bible is scholars take those manuscripts. They study them very, very closely. This is what textual critics do. They're types of scholars. And then from that, they come up with a Greek text of the new Testament. And then from the Greek, it's translated by different kinds of scholars, Greek scholars into English, right? This is how all of our, New Testaments, whether we read ESV, NIV, King James, whatever, have let all me, come to be. Let me summarize that real quick, just for so yeah. yeah I, I kind of I kind of view you as the scholar and me as the uh, me as the humble old <laughs> everyday everyday Joe. Hey, but hey, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm humble too. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but for the everyday Joe, if I'm just putting this into my terms, right? Yeah, there's thousands. There's thousands of different ancient Greek texts of the scripture that are written down and these textual critics take these, analyze them against each other to get mm -hmm. the most logical, what, what was the most logical intended meaning behind all of this when you look at all of these next to each other and then Correct. that is put into that is put into greek as a translation and then from there somebody is taking that and putting that into english Correct. is that, is that Correct. right so okay. yeah that that's like almost exactly spot on the only thing is the greek text like if you pick up a greek new testament that's not a translation the textual critics take the original manuscripts which are almost always written without any sort of uh, 
punctuation marks, parentheses, mm -hmm. and in all capital letters. That's how people wrote back then. The original letters of Paul were almost very likely featured all Greek capital letters with no paragraph breaks, no periods, no commas, nothing. That's how people wrote and read back then. And they just sort of figured out where the spaces and the breaks and the sentences were supposed to go. Yeah. Yes. Uh, textual critics take those original manuscripts, turn them into a Greek New Testament, which is then translated for us. When we use the word critic or textual criticism, it doesn't mean that they're being negative toward the text. It means they're closely analyzing it. So, so what, we on, we on the yeah, same page, what, Jesse? Yeah, we're on the same page. So okay. now, so these textual critics, Yeah. how does that play into this, that Paul uh, may have I'm, never I'm, written these words? That's exactly right. Okay, so I got to throw two more terms out here really quickly. A textual interpolation. Okay, this is a word. If you read commentaries, you're, you'll, you'll be familiar with this word, but if not, you probably won't be. Is where a passage is inserted into a text by a later writer, usually without the authority of the original writer. There's two places in the New Testament where most scholars think there has been a textual interpolation, which is why if you pick up a current ESV Bible, you will see over these passages probably a note that says very likely that this part of this book was not in the original letter or book. I'm talking about Mark chapter 16 verses 9 through 20, the last part of Mark's gospel and the story of the woman caught in adultery, which is John 7, 53 through 8, 11. A lot of people know this, but a lot of people don't. Most likely the story of the woman caught in adultery in John's gospel was not original to John's letter. Most New Testament scholars agree on that. Less unanimous that the ending of Mark is not original to Mark's letter, but still the vast majority believe that the last 11 verses in Mark are not original. And if you go read them, you can kind of see that it feels different. The language seems to change. Those are two places where in the New Testament, there is a possible interpolation, something that was added to the manuscripts after the original was written. So why would something like this have happened? That's a, I feel like that's a good question to. Maybe oh ask. man, it is a good question. I'm going to try and answer it. So there's a number of reasons why it could have happened. Um, in the case, I mean, there's a number of reasons why someone would come along and add something to a text later on. We don't really know for certain why either of these occurred. I mean, there's theories about, you know, um, the way, you know, ch church debates going on in the second and third century surrounding miracles and things like that. Maybe somebody added the end of Mark in as a way of saying, Hey, you know, go out into all the world, preach disciples, baptize them, heal the sick, raise the dead, uh, as a way of sort of adding some more gas to the discipleship flame, you know, like all mm -hmm. disciples do these things. Uh, maybe with, with the woman caught in adultery, I don't, I don't really know why people think someone would, would have added that to the text. Uh, I know I've read reasons in the past, but I can't, I can't recall. But the point is the point of saying all this is to say there are scholars who believe that the third significant, maybe textual interpolation or textual gloss. I never defined that word yet, but let me, let me define it right now. A textual gloss is when a note is added to the margin of a manuscript during the process of transmission. Usually this was done so that a scholar could sort of clarify what something meant, why a certain word might have been used, uh, how this might have applied in the first or second century. Glosses were not usually major things that were added. They were usually like marginal notes that, that, that scribes would have added. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, there are scholars who think that we are dealing here with either a gloss or an interpolation, that this was not part of Paul's original letter. And the reason why is simple. In the various manuscripts that exist of the New Testament, some of them that come from one part of the world have verse 34 and 35 right where we see it in our English Bibles. 
after verse 33. But in a whole nother class of manuscripts, these two verses are at the end of verse 40. They're in a completely different place in the letter. Now, the majority of scholars say these words are probably original because every manuscript has them. But there are some very reputable textual critics who say they're probably not original because if they are original, this would be the only case of the entire New Testament in the entire New Testament where something that is not original or that is original is found in two completely different places in the yeah. text. So from my understanding, what could have happened is that if this was a marginal note by a scribe, when it got put into an English translation, this got inserted into two different places because it was a marginal note rather than being part of the original text, which is plausible and easy to understand how that may have happened if it was not part of the original text. It was a marginal note. It's easy to understand how that could have gotten inserted in two spots. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, the most ardent supporter of this view was a guy named Gordon Fee. He passed away just a couple years ago. He was an excellent textual critic and biblical scholar who also happened to be an egalitarian. Um, He believed that men and women, you know, uh, the roles of men and women in the church were not as stiff as most traditional complementarians believe. But he made a very, and he wrote, Gordon Fee wrote an excellent commentary on First Corinthians that still to this day is sort of a standard bearer in New Testament scholarship. But he was also adamant that his view that First Corinthians 14, 34, and 35 was not original to Paul's letter was not because of his theology. It wasn't because he had an issue with what is said in the passage, but rather because of the textual critical issue. And he was the one that he, I mean, he wrote a whole synopsis in his commentary, which I, you know, I have, which says, if this is original to Paul's letter, this is the only place in the new Testament where we have an original part of a letter that is found in two completely different places in, in the document, which is interesting. And he, he urges more new Testament scholars to deal with the, with the text critical issue before they jump to dealing with the theological issue. And there's more people than this. Another sort of heavyweight New Testament scholar who was one of my professors, Richard Hayes, also holds the same view as Gordon Fee. He does not believe that this was original to Paul's letter. They both also argue that, you know, the wording and and the way it sort of just dropped in seemingly out of context, especially if you read verses 34 and 35 after verse 33, just don't really make sense. They don't fit the flow of the argument. So that's option two. Option two is these verses, let the women be silent in the church, are not original to Paul's letter. And honestly, Jesse, I think there is some weight to the arguments. Uh, it's definitely not impossible. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's an unreasonable argument and stance to have. Um, yeah. And I mean, maybe we can get back and I, I want to make sure we now cover option three. And this is yep. just for our listeners out there. This is going to sort of be more of an overview of the three stances today. And we can certainly kind of dive deeper into into each of these on a on a later episode. But we yeah. just want to give our listeners an idea of the three stances that are sort of valid, if you will on this um on this section today and and again it's to educate not indoctrinate we're not here to tell you uh what you should what you should believe about this we're here to tell you this is these are some of the possibilities and you know as listeners we hope that you guys are going home and searching the scriptures for yourself amen and going to the lord amen Um, amen so Option three. Yep. Option three. Option three. Yep. Uh, so option, 
Yep. Option three. And I uh, uh, just want to say, can't agree more with what you said. And uh, I would just encourage listeners don't latch on to anything we say and start defend, you know, especially don't, don't latch on to any of these views just because they feel the most comfortable to you without doing, you know, the, the studying and the research yourself. If you study this out yourself and God gives you conviction, that's when you're supposed to latch on to, you know, to something when God gives you conviction, not, not just because you like something the most. Anyway, I, I well said what you and, said, Jesse. And last oh. thing about this point, I would encourage our yeah. listeners, take 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35, and go ahead and do this exercise. Go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 14, but take verses 34 and 35, take them out and put it at the end of the passage rather yeah. than where you see them in your English Bibles today. Yeah. So go from verse 33 to 36 as you're reading, and then reinsert 34 and 35. And that's how about 50% of the, or another 50% of the original manuscripts that we have today, where they have that place. And just see if right. that reads any different to you. See if that yeah. comes across with actually a different, message than how you're understanding that today. Yep. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's a great exercise. It's, and it's all the Western manuscripts and we don't have like, maybe one day if, if people are interested, we can do a whole episode on textual criticism, but um, yeah, it's the Western manuscripts that have them have the pat, have the verses after verse 40 the reason that they're kept in English Bibles after verse 33 is because that's how Bibles have had them English Bibles for a long time. And so yeah. you know, people who translate and produce Bibles are not eager to go and make huge major changes unless they're absolutely certain of something, especially when people have been reading, you know, Corinthians a certain way for literally thousands of years. Um, so anyway, but it's a good exercise for, for people to do. All right. Third option is this Paul was speaking contextually specifically about wives of prophets being silent when their husband's prophecy was being weighed, discerned, tested. A lot of the, a lot of people in, you know, who talk about the, these things use the word sifted. I think that this view also makes a lot of sense that Paul isn't just calling for the universal silence of all women, but if you read the context, he's talking about when prophets prophesy and then other people in the church, particularly prophets, weigh what is being said by the prophet. This is something that the, that the early church did, by the way. Just because someone said, thus saith the Lord, doesn't mean everybody went, oh, okay, great, thanks. They actually considered is God saying this? Is this a word from the Lord? They didn't assume one another were infallible, which is a, an important lesson. When prophets are weighing what one another is saying, Paul could be saying, in that moment, wives of the prophets, don't be part, of, don't be one of the people that is sort of interrogating your husband in a public way because that that would be dishonorable. That would be shameful. That would be emasculating to your husband, which if we're talking about first century culture, it's kind of obvious. I mean, it would be very, very unorthodox for a woman to question her husband in public. Honestly, I've been in situations here and now in our culture where I find it uncomfortable when a woman sort of, well, uh, emasculates her husband in front of other people. Uh, maybe sure. we've all had experiences with this in, in, in some form or fashion. Yeah, um, I think there is, I mean, it's the same concept as if a as if a pastor or teacher was giving giving a message or a lesson to a group a group of believers, and his wife was to say, Well, hey, actually, I don't really agree with that. Or what about this? And what about yep. that? And yep. sort of derail the conversation rather than waiting yep. and then asking her husband 
later about her questions and what what he meant by that in a way that's honoring to her husband, especially when her husband has a position of eldership yep. or authority in that body of in that body of believers, which would also be the case, right, with somebody who is prophesying in the church, if prophets are the ones that are to be weighing what's being said, yep. not just not just I mean everybody there should absolutely discern have judge and exercise discernment, but um but I you know I find this section interesting. The spirits of prophets are subject to prophets, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. We're talking about prof other prophets judging what's being said, not necessarily the wives of a prop the wife of a prophet. Correct. And, and you know, Jesse, the, the thing about that and, and granted we live in a completely different culture. I mean, our culture is so different from first century middle Eastern culture. It's not even funny. I mean, honestly, the strongest argument against this view is that it's too obvious. Like, People who hold to the first view we mentioned would come along and say women in the first century wouldn't even question or interrogate their husbands at home, let alone in a public setting like that. That's too obvious. But the thing about this, if this is true, this third option, what Paul is saying is if if I was in church, which I am often with my wife or we're, we know, we're in a home group and people are sharing and 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 saying things and, and encouraging one another or sharing something that's on their heart. If my wife said something that I wasn't sure about, I wouldn't question her in front of people. I mean, I wouldn't do that to her. She wouldn't do it to me, but I wouldn't do it to her either. It's just loving. If you live with someone and you're in covenant with someone, you don't like call them out in front of people. If, if you feel like there's something that you need to hear clarified or potentially could be wrong. I mean, I would, most likely in most cases, unless there was something that I really felt like, you know, needed to be addressed, I would do that at home. So it's, it's not crazy to think that he's saying this at all, in my opinion. Um, yeah. But, and I think, you know, the argument from a lot of the conservative evangelicals that would say, this is just too obvious. <laughs> Nobody in this culture would have done that. Remember that Paul was writing to the Corinthians. There's a lot of things that the Corinthians were doing <laughs> that was right. Necessarily orthodox. appropriate and orthodox in That's the true. culture of that day. That's true. That's true. Uh, that that's absolutely true. And and you know you could make the case the fact that Paul has already talked about women prophesying and praying and and this whole context of when you come together. First Corinthians fourteen. Everybody has a word, has a song. If anyone has a a revelation or a hymn or a lesson, bring it forth. I mean, he's already breaking down barriers by saying, hey, and just before this in chapter 12, he talked about how we're one body with many members and every single part of the body is identified with the head of the body. In other words, Jesus is the head and we're not all individual men. I mean, we're all individual members, but we're not separate members. We're all a part of one body body. I mean, it's incredible. If you actually think about the culture that they were living in, how far Paul has already gone in this letter. Blake, uh, yeah. Blake, I think there's one thing that we may have forgotten to address before we, before we started diving into this view, which is the Greek word for women. Yeah. So I was just about to get to. Okay, good. Because yeah. Because it makes actually a big, it makes a big difference because we may have some listeners out there yep. right now who are saying, I don't see how you're getting that interpretation at all. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So context of this passage is very much, you know, Paul been talking about how the church comes together, people sharing things. He never limits tongues or prophecy to only men. He never limits sharing a song or a lesson or a revelation to only men. He gets to this point where he starts talking about prophets speaking and when they prophesy, let it be two or at the most three. He's all about order. He's trying to bring order to the Corinthian church. You're not, you know, they, they it seems like we're doing things very sporadically. 
and very unorderly, and it was causing confusion for people. He's all about bringing order. And in this co immediate context, he's talking about prophets weighing what one another says. And then he gets to the women. But here's the thing, the Greek word for women if you're speaking modern Greek, it's translated like hunekes. If you're speaking, you know, in the old Koine Greek pronunciation, at least the way you're taught when you learn Koine Greek, it's gunaikes or gunaikos. Uh, women and wives, same word. In Greek, there's no two distinct words for woman or wife. There's no two distinct words for the word man or husband. In Greek, there's lots of words that have like, or concepts that have multiple different ways of saying them. Like people have probably heard there's one English word for love, but there's four Greek words for love. This is one situation where Greek is much more simple and there's less options. If you're talking about a woman or you're talking about someone's wife, those aren't two different words. It's the same word and how you translate it is based on the context. So did I say that in a clear way, Jesse? Yeah, I think so. I think the I think the challenge that we have here is that it says in verse 34, the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says, if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. Now, just basic basic logic here right but you can't ask your husband at home first of all if you are a an unmarried if you are an unmarried woman and there is actually a greek word for virgin right to my understanding yes yes, yes. so you know using you know this word women may better be translated wives to ask your husband at home not necessarily all women everywhere Correct. And if we are talking about wives now in this context and talking about the spirit of prophets being subject to prophets and in this very context about weighing what is being said, it makes a lot more sense that this is referring to the wives of the prophets <clears throat> to keep silent when their husband has given a word of prophecy. And that prophecy is being tested. And that prophet is being weighed. weighed. Yes. And so people might be asking, why do no English Bibles translate the, the word wives in this passage, if that's a possibility? And the reason is this. People who translate the Bible into English are very skeptical. They're, no, not skeptical. They're very hesitant about limiting something that the apostle said that's not supposed to be limited. So they translate the, the word Gunekes as wives when they're absolutely sure that Paul is addressing married women. I think there's a very, very high probability that if this passage is original, Paul is addressing married women. And there's obvious reasons for that that Jesse just said. The, the women in this passage are told to ask their husbands at home if they want to learn something, anything. I think specifically regarding what's being said by the prophets, but they're hesitant to say that because it's just not 100. They're hesitant to translate the word wives instead of women because it's not 100% clear based on the context. But what we're saying is it's the same word in Greek. There is no other way for Paul to address wives in this passage other than using this word. And so it's very possible that he could be addressing married women in this context, not just all women, which would mean he is likely addressing the wives of the prophets who he was just talking about. It would also make a lot more sense considering that in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul uh -huh. gives instruction to women who are prophesying or praying in church to keep their heads covered Correct. while doing so, which you know would indicate to me that Maybe that's not what he was talking about when he said, be silent, considering Correct. you can't be silent to pray and prophesy in church. <laughs> Correct. Correct. So Jesse, can we try, can we try reading this just in context? 
like the whole passage. I mean, yeah, not the whole passage, but yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. And I'm going to leave verse 34 where it's at in the ESV just because that's what's on the screen. I don't want to confuse anyone. But do what Jesse said and try reading it where you take 34, verse 34 and 35 and put them after verse 40. It might even make more sense there. But this is how it would go if this third option is correct. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And by the way, oftentimes when Paul addresses brothers, he's addressing the whole church because it's laborious to write out brothers and sisters, but it's assumed you'll find this in the ESV footnote that he's talking to the entire congregation. It's like when I say, hey, guys. Exactly like I'm when you say, everybody. hey, guys. <laughs> which they actually no longer I'm not, say. I'm not going to bend into saying that to this whole modern culture of saying, hey, guys, that's not inclusive enough. Which is what they did on the show Survivor. I know. Some people still watch Survivor, and 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 they don't say, hey, guys, anymore on Survivor because it's not inclusive. But anyway, that's a whole other topic. Uh, <laughs> so when you come together, brothers and sisters, you all, each one has a hymn, lesson, revelation, tongue, interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be only two or at the most three and each in turn and let someone interpret. Remember what Paul already said earlier in the chapter. If someone speaks in tongues in the church, there has to be an interpretation. And if, if you're all believers in the church, if you're all, you know, people that are regular attendees, if there's no one new, you don't even need to speak in tongues. You can just prophesy. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to themselves and to God. So that's the first time someone has been told in a specific setting, in a specific context to keep silent. If there's no one to interpret a tongue, the one who speaks in was going to speak in tongues, stay quiet. Speak to yourself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to one sitting there, let the first be silent. Another instance of someone being told to be silent. If prophets are bringing forth prophecy and one of the prophets has a revelation, they, they go, oh man, the Lord just started speaking to me. The person who's talking is quiet. And you let the person who just had a word from the Lord speak. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. Remember, let the others weigh what is said by the prophet. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So someone brings forth a word. The other prophets are weighing what is said because, because God's not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. The wives should keep silent in the churches. What are we talking about? If we're doing this reading, the wives of the prophets, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. Remember, we're talking about prophets weighing what one another are saying. If you read it this way, for it is shameful for a wife of a prophet to speak in church. And according to this reading, the, you know, the unspoken next phrase is when their husband's prophecy is being tested by the other prophets. That's the reading. If we take the third option, Jesse. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think? Does it make sense? It does. I think one other thing, <clears throat> I think one other thing to add is that yeah. in the Greek manuscripts that we have that we've translated as we described earlier and now have our English translations today, there were no paragraph breaks. Heck, there wasn't even punctuation. Yep. And this, you see on the screen here, right before verse 34, there's a paragraph break and it says, as in all the churches of the saints, I find what's interesting is that we have a paragraph break there, Yep. but there is no paragraph break when you look at these original manuscripts and this verse 
34 through 36, that is in two different places where, where they're where it's at now or at the end of verse 40 um, in some in some o- older manuscripts. That section, as in all the churches of the saints, never is in a different place. It is always after verse 33 in every in every manuscript for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So correct as readers. One thing that we can get ourselves in trouble with is if we are taking this section as in all the churches of the saints and applying that to this, to the, to the subsequent verses, 34 through 36. And we start saying, see, it says that in all churches of the saint, all the churches of the saints, women are to be silent. Right. It is actually saying that for God is a God of confusion, not a God of confusion, excuse me, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. Exactly. That, that section applies to the previous, is a, supposed to be applied to the previous verse, not necessarily to verse 34 through 30, uh, not necessarily 34 and 35. Exactly. And and we actually know why there's there's some controversy about this. When the verse numbers were added, the, the people who added them correctly put a verse break right here before the word, the, before the phrase, the women should keep silent. That's verse 34. Some people thought afterward that this phrase, as in all the churches of the saints, goes better with verse 34 than it does with verse 33. So you have in some Greek Bibles, a paragraph break right in between two sentences in verse 33. But how do we know for certain that this goes at the end of verse 33? Because as Jesse just said, even though starting in verse 34, this is found in two different places, depending on what Greek manuscript you're reading, this phrase, as in all the churches of the saints, is never found in two different places. It's always directly after the phrase, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So in so Gordon Fee... So 34 and 35 were actually like a footnote in the margin. If they were. That that got added into, if they were, if they got added into two different places, back to kind of, you know, view number two. Yep. That section is in all the churches of the saints was not ever. Correct. And that was always to be found right after verse 33. And, And if you read the commentary I mentioned earlier by Gordon Fee, he takes huge issue with this. He says, at the very least, English Bible translations and Greek Bibles should always include this phrase, as in all the churches of the saints, after, you know, as part of verse 33. They should not be putting a paragraph break here because there's no controversy about this phrase. It always appears in the same place. Yeah. And he believes it fits much better in context. Uh, when you take verse 34, the women should keep silent and put it at the end of verse 40. So that, that would look like this. If we read it, how some manuscripts read it, it would just go like this. Verse, verse 31, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Verse 36. Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone that thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. The women should keep silent in the churches or the wives. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. That's how it goes in some of the manuscripts. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's shameful for a wife or woman to speak in church. I mean, I think we've we've done a lot of unpacking and explaining in this episode, Jesse. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, a lot for people to think about. Yeah, given a lot of 
for people to think about. I think the first traditional view on this, um, there's some challenges with that, especially considering women are instructed as to how to pray and prophesy in the church and it's being done. There are women prophets, right? So I think that this is, um, you know, these two other explanations could both certainly be valid. Um, I'd say we come back and continue to, you know, explore this topic some more, but hopefully this gives our listeners uh, a little bit, a little bit more of an understanding of how else this can be, how else this can be interpreted. Right. And if you're, and if you're confused, if you're listening today and if you're confused on, well, why does it say this, but why are, you know, in other places, you know, women prophesying in church and, yeah, and these things, these could be some of the reasons why. Yep. That's right. That's right. Um, maybe in our next one, um, we can talk about, ah, uh, yeah, well, we can talk next, about what, what Paul means when he says, as the law also says, cause there's, there's various opinions. There's nothing specific that anybody knows that he could be referring to. So there's ideas and arguments for each one, but yeah, I mean, I think the traditional view, you know, um, it has a lot of supporters, but contextually with the rest of the letter, it doesn't really make sense. If you just take it as a plain blanket statement, Yeah. the second view that there's a textual critical issue, I think has holds a lot of weight. I'm not willing to support it. I don't know which one of these views is right. I feel confident. The first one isn't right. Um, although people who hold that view would fire back and say, look, just read the words, uh, as they're written. And it's pretty clear. It's like, okay, but then you still have to explain what first Corinthians 11, five means. I think option three makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, that Paul's addressing wives of prophets when their husband's prophecy is being tested and weighed. I hope people do some studying on their own and maybe send us some questions and we will come back to this topic of women in the church uh, sometime in the not too distant future. Absolutely. One more thing I want to kind of just clear the air on too, Blake, is that when we talk about believing in the infallibility of God's word, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're not here to pick apart scripture and say, Hey, Oh, this was added. And that was added. See, this can't be trusted, right? God's word can absolutely be trusted. It is a hundred percent. God breathed. It is infallible, but this reminds me of a clip I saw recently of, uh, of a pastor telling his congregation that the King James Bible is the word of God, every word, and that he could take this book and correct the Greek with that. Incorrect. Incorrect, sir. Yeah, <laughs> that that is a big misunderstanding. That our English translations of the Bible are are what's infallible. It's right the original God breathed word as written down by the men of God who wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, as these things got translated absolutely there's possibilities that things happen and slipped in that we don't that are not necessarily god breathed now i will say that god i believe he protects his word and i believe he protects the overall message of of how his word gets out to people across nation. So I'm not sitting here reading my ESV or my King James and saying, Oh, I can't trust this. Absolutely. I can, but we need to go a little deeper, right? That's why, um, that's why the Bereans were considered more noble, right? Because they studied the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so they, they were students of the word. So let's be students of the word. Let's dig a little bit deeper and, and under and seek to understand what God's original intent was when men wrote down his words. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the way that I, I well said, Jesse, the way that God preserved his word is through copying it. <laughs> I mean, the, yeah. 
anybody who believes in biblical inerrancy doesn't believe that when they pick up an ESV Bible or an NIV Bible or a King James Bible, that it's perfect. But we believe that the original inspired autographs of scripture are perfect. And the fact that there are now thousands and thousands of copies available means that in almost all situations where there are slight differences, and most of the differences in manuscripts are very, very slight. 99% of them make no difference when it comes to the meaning of the text. But when there are these differences in manuscripts, we can go back and look and see where possible changes might have been made. Has every single question been answered so that we can say with 100% certainty that we know exactly, exactly what every original manuscript said in every situation? No, but we are awfully close, awfully yeah. close. And what God has preserved is the original meaning. That's what we believe when we say we believe in biblical inerrancy, that the word can be trusted. And so, um, Amen. yeah. Well, we, why don't we uh, close this out, man? Okay. Uh, I'm just, I, I, I want to end this episode in prayer. Uh, Father, thank you for your love for us and for your grace and mercy for the chance to even come on here and talk about things like this. Would you be with all of our listeners as they digest and process uh, all this information that we covered today? Would you inspire and stir them to go and search the scriptures for themselves to see whether these things are so? Would you bring conviction and understanding to the hearts of people who genuinely want to know the truth and walk in it? And Lord, would you be with everyone this week, especially as they celebrate with their families, with their church families, the resurrection, the, the death, atoning sacrifice, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and it's in his name that we pray and give you all the praise. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to the That You May Know Him podcast. We are available on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also watch all of our episodes on YouTube, Rumble, or on our website, thatyoumayknowhim.com which is the best place to listen to all of our past episodes, to watch all of our current episodes, and to go back and look at our series library and see all the things that we've talked about and covered over the years on this podcast. You can also check out our blog, Coffee with God, which has a lot of free resources available as well. If you got something out of this episode or you've been blessed by anything that we've done, please consider giving us a like and subscribing to our channel. We are 100% listener supported. And if you want to learn about how you can support our ministry, you can learn more at our website. Again, www.thatyoumayknowhim.com. For Jesse Dunn, I'm Blake Barbera signing off. We will see you next week. Stay blessed, live loved, and thank you so much for watching and listening to That You May Know Him.